Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh everyone Welcome to a new episode of Decolonizing the Narrative I am currently joined by my dear brother Avon Assalamu alaikum, welcome to the podcast bro um, Today is a very different type of episode Because normally we've been talking a lot about history And obviously today we've got a picture of Ibn Sina at the back But to be honest, today's episode is more in line with Islam And Avon, so just to give a quick introduction You can tell me how good or bad I do uh, is a fourth year medic He has a degree in anatomy. anatomy mashallah, At King's College London He's currently studying medicine He's in his fourth year So he's in placement this year And one more year until he obviously graduates inshallah. And he is someone who I met Only recently to be honest I met him a few months ago mashallah, And he's an amazing brother So I gave a bit of an introduction But do you want to introduce yourself a bit more properly, I think. So, uh, uh, Salam alaikum. Salam. Thank you for having me on the podcast. Um, so, my name is Ayman Abdurrahim. I'm a fourth year med student at St George's at the moment. But I keep talking. I'm just going to fix the mic, the, the camera. <laughs> um, I'm a fourth year med student at St George's, but I used to attend King's College where I did an anatomy degree. And alhamdulillah, I met Mahdi about four, five months ago. Very, very good brother. And I've watched his podcast and I saw a few of them, and I had this idea of coming on and doing something related mm. but from a healthcare point of view so inshallah it's going to be a beneficial episode and inshallah we'll both learn something new and have something to teach you guys as well inshallah inshallah so the premise this video this is a lot about health um it's about you know we have we have different topics that we're going to talk about islamic perspective on them but also how they can be integrated like various different things which just mainly beneficial to health, so even from an un Islamic perspective, but just a natural, you know, like human perspective. But how Islam actually fits that human perspective and creates that human perspective, um, and in regards to health. And when I say health, I mean obviously, you know, diet, I mean medical health, medicine, because we're going to talk a bit about medicine as well. Being a medical student, mashallah, and as someone who studies history, I know a bit about history of medicine, alhamdulillah, I studied a bit of that. So we're going to be talking about those various things. It's going to be a free-flowing discussion as all my podcasts are, inshallah. So I think, obviously, Eamon, being a doctor and being a prepared man, an older man, mashallah, he, come, he came prepared with a lot of you know, notes for, for today's podcast episode, which is good. Uh, he tried not to, because he wants to be more concise and be precise with it. Sure. I've come with nothing, obviously. I always just yap on these podcasts, everyone knows. So obviously, we'll start at the beginning. So what is health and why is health important in Islam? So what... Yeah, I'll let you start, bro, inshallah. Yeah, no, right. so in terms of health, there's a lot of different perspectives on what health is. You know, some people think that health is just absence of disease, um, but it's more so a state of being. So, you know, it's comprised of your physical health, your mental health, emotional health, spiritual health, and they all come together and are contributing factors to this global image of health. So it could be, you know, how well you feel in yourself, um, so sort of these are types of questions that we ask patients, you know, as doctors. Um, have you noticed any changes, anything that's been sort of affecting you mentally, emotionally? Mm. And that contributes to the whole idea of health. And in terms of how, why is it important in Islam? Mm. So Islam is not just a religion of the soul, but it's a physical religion. So if we go back to the five pillars of Islam, you've got your shahada, which is your testimony of faith. Um, mm -hmm. You've got Salah, so Salah is a physical thing where you stand up to pray five times a day. <clears throat> then you've got your fasting, and fasting, again, has an element of health to it because you need to physically be able to fast, which is why illness is one of the reasons why you can be excused from fasting. And the other one is Hajj, so Hajj, if you've ever been, I haven't been able to go yet, but Inshallah, inshallah Allah inshallah. will invite us both. We've both completed and Umrah, he, he actually completed Umrah recently, yeah. That's a short hair. That's a short hair on his head. <laughs> Um, but Hajj is a physically, very physically demanding um, pillar mm. of our faith. Mm. So being able to be fit and well enough to complete, complete it, right? that pilgrimage, yeah. it's something that health is really important for. Mm. Um, in terms of sort of the linking of, or the evidence for why health is important in our religion. So mm. there's a hadith by Prophet Muhammad sallallahu where Ibn Abbas reported that there are two blessings that people waste and it's their free time and health. Which just goes back to reiterate how important our health is because you know it can be something as simple as when you have a cold and you lose your sense of smell and taste, yeah, and you've never taken it for granted until you're ill and you can no longer taste food. But that's just on the minor thing. So, as you get older, Alhamdulillah, I've been very fortunate enough to be on a geriatrics placement, which is older people, 
and I've asked so many of them, you know, do you have any regrets? And they always say, you know, if I looked after my health when I was younger, my health would look after me now when I'm older. <laughs> Subhanallah. So Subhanallah, it's something that we never realize what we have and we take it for granted when we're older. So Inshallah, you know, we can sort of change that narrative so that us as young Muslims can prioritize our health and that when we get older, our health will look after us. And even if you look at basic Islamic principles, like for example, one of the major rules and everyone who's non-Muslim highlights the fact that Muslims aren't allowed to drink alcohol. And of course there's a wisdom behind that that's far superior to what we even know. If you look at the basic fundamental, what is alcohol? It's something which intoxicates you. It's something which harms you ultimately. There's a lot of harms of alcohol. I want you to highlight a bit more of that, inshallah. There's a lot of harms in alcohol. And that's why, even if you see the modern, there's a lot of um, scholars who say stuff like smoking is forbidden. Why? Because it's something which harms your body. So anything which harms you is haram. So it's, Islam literally is highlighting the importance of health, not just on a personal level, but on a religious level. So you not taking care of yourself by smoking and drinking, that you're doing something haram. And it's because you're not taking care of yourself, you're because you're not taking care of your own health. And just to go back on some of the stuff that you said, because you gave a lot of uh, information there, mashallah, is that, okay, so you were saying how our five pillars of Islam all relate to you know, our health, our physical health. Is that also down, do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like uh, those five pillars of Islam, which is so deeply and rooted into your health, because even if you look at the concessions of, you know, as you said, the, the hajj and the fasting, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making it easy upon us because of our health. So going past that, do you think this is a key reason to why, you know, Islamic scholars in the past were the main, you know, brains behind Islamic, not even just Islamic, but medicine in general, because it was, it was said in, you know, in the Quran and Hadith. Yeah, definitely, because sort of looking at scholars of the past, when it came to them, you know, learning and exploring and understanding more about science and history and the deen itself and using the Quran and the Sunnah and Islam as a basis for their knowledge, mm -hmm. they were able to understand that health is so important, which is why we've put Ibn Sina behind us, but mm -hmm. he was one of the forefathers within Islamic science. And them having a better understanding of why health is so important and how it enables us to be better Muslims, better people, better contributors to society is something that made their contribution to science so impactful. And it goes back to, like you were saying, about how it's not only about doing things that are good for us, but also staying away from things that are bad for us. For example, the smoking, the drinking, you know, um, our health, our body, our amana. So it's something that we've been entrusted with and we are going to be accountable mm. for how we look after ourselves. You know, for example, when someone dies, we always say, Inna lillahi wa inna raji'un, which means that we are from God and to Him we will return. Him, right? And when we return our bodies, we'll be questioned on how we look after it. Did we give it the hap, the right that it deserves? Did we treat it with respect? You know, I could give you an example. You know, if a friend of yours borrowed your car, you'd want them to look after it, to clean it, to put good fuel in it, mm. and return it back to you in a state that they, you gave it to them, or even better. So it's sort of using that as an analogy for how we treat our health and how we look after our health is really important. So it's fundamental to being Muslims. Exactly. And I touched on it a bit when I was referring to you know alcohol. But how would you? How important do you think diet is? Because oftentimes, I'll be honest, when you see Muslim communities, there's not a care of diet. You know, you, you see, for example, I'm going to highlight the Bengali community or the South Asian community. The uncles all. Wide, mashallah. Ooh, mashallah, they they're eating a bit too well. I can't lie, um, but it's like that dieting. You know, you see in Ramadan, for example, Ramadan. Why is Ramadan put in place? It's put in place for us to to sacrifice food for the sake of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. To sacrifice to to be hungry for Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. To understand also the struggle of the Sahaba and and the various different communities which are don't aren't fortunate enough to have food. So, Ramadan is purpose. So firstly, I've got two questions actually. One is, how important is diet in Islam? And number two, is the purpose of Ramadan and in its way of trying to take people away, do you think a lot of Muslims nowadays, it might be a controversial question, but do you think a lot of Muslims nowadays are beginning to miss the point of Ramadan? Because you look at how luxurious and huge some iftars are, which wasn't always accustomed to how the Sahaba used to and the Prophet Muhammad used to, used to celebrate. Yeah. 
So to ask your question firstly, like diet is huge within this. So I mean, as humans, we have sort of our basal, mm. our basic needs, which are sleep, food, water, and um, lust or libido. Yes. But food is within our sort of animalistic nature that we need food to survive. It's not. It's not something that can be argued. It's fact that we need food to survive. Now, something you mentioned, which is very good or very important, is that you said within South Asian culture. And subhanAllah, within demographics which are higher in Muslims, for example, I'm half Yemeni, half Eritrean. Yeah. And in the Middle East, in South Asia, there's a disproportionately higher risk of diabetes, uh, heart disease, overweight, obesity. So there's something there that's underlying and it's majority to do with diet, but also sedentary lifestyle. Yeah. Now, to go back to the... Islam and sort of understand Islam's perspective on it. You know, in the Quran it says, "Kulu wa sharbu wa la which means to eat and drink and to not be wasteful. And it shows that we do need to eat and we do need to drink, but to not be excessive and to not be wasteful. Yeah, yeah. And sort of it goes back to the point that you were mentioning about, you know, during Ramadan you see these iftars which are sort of grandeur in nature and they're luxurious which are over the top and sort of defeats the purpose of Ramadan. But I'm going to come back to that later on. So the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in an authentic hadith that there is no vessel that a human can feel worse than his stomach, mm. and to essentially only eat as much as he needs. And you may have heard this principle before, you know, a third food, a third water, and a third air. And it's moderation because Islam is a deen of, is a religion of moderation to do everything moderately, nothing too excessive, no gluttony, but also not scarcity. Starvation, yeah. Exactly. So. To sort of go back to your second question about the principle of Ramadan. So Ramadan to fast is one of the five pillars of Islam, which um, is a obligatory act of worship for all Muslims who are able to do so. Obviously, there are certain exclusions like illness and traveling. But essentially, the basis of Ramadan or the reason why we fast is to show that we are able to give up our desires. So our nafs or our innate nature, one of the things it craves is food, which is why excessive eating is something that's not viewed on preferably within Islam. And Ramadan is proof that us as humans are able to submit our desires for the greater good or as Allah has decreed for us to do. And this period of 30 days is also a period of spiritual cleansing. So by being able to give up our desires, we're able to reflect deeply within ourselves and able to understand that, you know, within our desires, for example, uh, refraining from excessive talking, you know, using bad language, smoking, drinking, um, we're able to do. We're able to give those up for the sake of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And going back to the point you said about the excessive um, feast that we see on iftar. <laughs> uh, I mean, you fast in Ramadan. I fast in Ramadan. Alhamdulillah. You know how it is. We can fast 14, 15. There were certain years we were fasting 19 hours. Yeah. And we'd be at our absolute, you know, knees when Maghrib comes. But you know, three dates and water, and we're stuffed. So it shows that really and truly, it doesn't take that much to... I was actually going to ask as well, yeah, sure. medically. So you're a medical, obviously, so we're going to you know, take, take that for granted. Medically, is it actually... I, I heard it's actually bad. So when you're... Do you know when someone hasn't eaten in a while? Because I, I know those people... Do you know those people who do the challenges where they don't eat for like 10 days or something like that mm-hmm. to lose weight? They can't suddenly have a large influx of things because otherwise their body... There's something happens that there's danger. So... Can you explain that a bit? Because yeah, sure. I feel like sort of the viewers might benefit from it. Yeah. So um, what you're describing is something called refeeding syndrome. Okay. So essentially, what happens is for a prolonged period of time, mm-hmm. your body's essentially been starved of certain nutrients. So some of the important ones are potassium, sodium, and magnesium. Mm. So these are minerals that are found naturally in foods, and if you drink London water, it's in there as well. But essentially, what happens is your body's been starved of it so long that you enter something called um, hypokalemia, which is low potassium and hypermagnesia, which is low magnesium. And what happens is when you take in all this food, it goes from having absolutely nothing to too much of it, and your body's not able to regulate it. But you also have to remember that your digestive system has basically been turned off for the last 10 days. So now it has to deal with all this food, and it hasn't been working for the last 10 days. So then your body goes into overdrive, and it can cause so many issues. So um, you can get triggered IBS, which is irritable bowel syndrome. Mm. You can get constipation, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting. So it's not really a pretty Im- uh, image. So that's why a lot of them, I see a lot of them eat fruit. How come, what's that? What's, what's the reason for that? 
And that's why Prophet was breaking, breaking the fast, you know, when he used to break the fast, he used to break it with a date. Yeah. He didn't, he, he actually said, he either break it with a date, and some, some, I think some people say like an olive or some was a fruit, form of fruit mm. or water, not to have, not to break it with, uh, there wasn't a piyadu or a pakora at the time of the Prophet <laughs> but not to break it with, you know, rice or, there's a wisdom behind that. And there's a medicinal reason behind it. So can you explain the medicinal reasoning behind you know, doing that? Because you were explaining like how you can't eat straight away, but why is it that fruit and water is kind of okay? Cool. So subhanAllah, dates are, have such a huge um, importance in our religion, alhamdulillah. But even medically, dates are one of the only fruits that when you actually consume them, it doesn't spike your blood sugar. Which is why it's so important that because you haven't been fasting for so, you've been fasting for so long and you haven't eaten any food, your blood sugar is going to be low. But you want to be able to safely increase that without spiking your glucose. Because when you spike your blood glucose, your insulin also spikes as well. And that can lead to some of the conditions we see within our community, sort of like insulin resistance and diabetes. A lot of diabetes in this. A lot of diabetes. Especially in the South Asian community, mm. a lot. Of, like my dad has diabetes, a lot of my dad's family has diabetes. Alhamdulillah, I don't have it yet, at least. No. But, Inshallah, you Inshallah, I don't. But a lot of it has happened. And why is that as well, do you think? So, okay, finish the first point and then... Yeah. Like, so, the importance of fruit is, when you consume fruit, it is a natural source of sugar. So, it's a cleaner source than, for example, having you know, a chocolate bar or sweets. But also fruit contains fiber and what fiber does is it helps to fill, um, fill you up and make you feel more satiated so you're less likely to snack but also when you combine sugar with um, fiber it also reduces your insulin spike so you may have seen some people that have like um, this uh, insulin monitor yeah, that's yeah, tapped on yeah. the yeah, arm yeah. and you can connect it to the app so what that can actually do is monitor your blood glucose rise and also your insulin rise and I've seen some patients use that after eating dates their blood sugar doesn't spike and the insulin doesn't spike but if they have a chocolate bar, 30 minutes later, their blood glucose is through the roof and then the insulin spikes up as well. Which is why, you know, if you have sugar for breakfast, for example, if you have, you know, sweets, chocolate, etc. for breakfast, you're going to have a quick sugar rush in the morning and they're going to have a crash by around lunchtime, and which is why you can feel lethargic and really tired. To go back to your second question, which was why insulin is so high within our communities. Why diabetes is why, di- why diabetes is so high within our community. It stems from a lot of things. So, for example, we're looking at it at the older generation. Mm. And one thing that's very common within the older generation is a sedentary lifestyle. So, you know, alhamdulillah, we're young. You were telling me the other day you played football twice in a day. Mm. You know, I go to the gym. So, alhamdulillah, within our younger generation, we do have a better appreciation for physical activity and why it's so important. Not only for our physical health, but for our mental health. You know, you've had a long day at uni. You want to de-stress. Go to the gym. Mm. You go for a run. Mm. You've had a long week. You go kickball. So, alhamdulillah, we're able to appreciate that. But the older generation, because no one explained to them how important physical exercise is, that mentality that they've grown up with is one where, you know, exercise is for young people. And it's taken an effect on their body, which is, you know, now their knees hurt, they've got back problems. So, for them to make the same physical effort that we do, it takes a lot of mental Strength. strength. And they need to be able to sort of undo the sort of mental programming they've had for the last you know, 20, 30 years. That's one aspect of it. But also it's from a cultural point of view. So for example, I'm half Yemeni, so a lot of our dishes are rice based, you know, mendi, Same with yeah. Um, yeah. We have a lot of sweet dishes as well. So the food within our culture isn't the healthier food. It is the tastiest. I mean, I'm not gonna say no to some mendi if you're gonna offer me some, yeah. but it's not the, again, you can have it in moderation. Everything is fine in moderation. But sort of with our cultural dishes, it's something, you know, you go home, mum's making it every day, every other day. When guests are coming over, we're making it in twice, three times yeah. the size. The variety is on the table. Yeah. And it's the same thing in South Asian culture. I can exact imagine. same thing, exact same thing. And sort of the foods that we're eating are things that are going to spike your insulin. So, you know, there's a lot of rice, which is a um, not the best of complex carbs. So you eat it. Blood sugar goes up, insulin spikes up as well. A lot of fried dish, you know, pakora, gulab jamun, jalebi. <laughs> I, know, I know myself. Hasnain, Hasnain on the last episode, yeah, <laughs> he just started listing like every single <laughs> sweet dish in the entire, in the in the entire Pakistan <laughs> and Bangladesh and India. So we've done that already. We didn't even go into that. Yeah. But so also, so I know there was, um, I think, I don't know how authentic the hadith is. But there was a hadith that the Prophet so, so. only used to have meat, I think, every 40 days. Mm. Because of the scarcity of it at its time And some scholars have said Because all oh, that Because of how scarce it was 
it wasn't able because you're living in a desert, right? You can't get meat every day. So when they would get it, it would be a luxury. So oftentimes you would have, you know, barley, you would have bread, you would have fruits, and that was what they would, you know, it wasn't even fruits, it was dates you would get, you'd get by with. Was, do you think that there's a wisdom behind even that, the fact that he wasn't able to have meat all the time? Because I often see a lot of now vegans, <laughs> it's like it's not about vegans, a lot of vegans nowadays are explaining like the health benefits of not eating meat and not doing this. From a medical perspective, are there benefits, are there drawbacks? And how does that link in with the Islamic perspective? I think going back to my initial point where I said that Islam is a religion of moderation. So everything is okay in moderation. And meat is important, you know. Um, for men, it's really important in tes- testosterone production mm. that we consume some red meat. Uh, for women as well, it's a really important source of iron. Mm. So women have a higher iron demand than men because of also menstrual cycle, etc. But there's so many um, essential nutrients and minerals that come from it. B12, iron... Um, is that is that fat based? No, it's meat based. It's yeah. not from fat because it's not fat because also yeah. and then this is this is actually you know what is it's it's not purely just a topic just about Islam. But also, do you know for like people who go gym for example, right? The protein, a lot of people shy away from um, you know steak because yeah. they have uh, it's fat content. But I think I heard that, that that fat content from a steak, for example, is actually beneficial. Yeah. Is it? Is it? it is so. Red meat and steak is a good source of cholesterol. Mm. Now, obviously, we hear a lot of bad things about cholesterol. You know, your parents always tell you, oh, my cholesterol is high. Yeah. But cholesterol is really important because it's one of the precursors that are required for steroid um, hormone production. So things like cortisol, cortisol is a stress hormone. And obviously, when we are stressed, because we are university students, our stress goes up. But it's mm. also one of our um, basal hormones that are required you know, for staying alive. When it comes to waking up, our cortisol is at its highest when we wake up, which is why we wake up. And if you think about to our sort of hunter-gatherer lifestyle, at that point we'd wake up and go hunting. And that's when our stress hormone would be highest. So cholesterol is really important. And it does have a bad rap from our previous generation because, you know, they always said, you know, eggs are bad because they have high cholesterol. But eggs are actually really good because they have high density um, lipoprotein. So you've got two types of cholesterol, which is your HDL or high density, and your LDL, which is your low density. The low one or the bad one is the things that you find in like seed oils, but the good ones are things that you find in eggs. And you want to make sure you have a balance of a lot of the high or the good ones, and try and reduce the low ones. So steak is really good, but again in moderation. So don't have steak three times a day because mm. everything is because everything is in moderation. Islamically, exactly what you're saying it's, it's everything is in moderation. But okay, another thing is then the importance of vegetables. Because we're talking about diet a lot, you know. So where does vegetables fit into this, into that, that sort of, you know? So vegetables, I mean, our parents always told us, eat your vegetables. Yeah. You know? um, but again, like I was mentioning with the fruits, they're a good source of fiber, but also a good uh, natural source of vitamins. You know, your parents always said vitamin, uh, if you eat your carrots, you know, you have good eyesight, mm. um, which is, Slightly true, but carrots are rich in vitamin A, and vitamin A is also called beta carotene, and that's needed for normal functioning eyes. It's not going to give you super eyesight, but it's good for you. Mm. And there's a lot of things like they're called phytonutrients, and those are more highly found in organic vegetables. So if you're able to get organic fruit and vegetables, then go for it. But sort of that, there used to be a huge drive in schools before you might have you know get your five a day. And that was just to make sure that you had a balanced diet. And this sort of echoes what Islam is, which is about, um, about moderation, about having a balance. So, you know, you're getting a, a good variety of your fruits, your vegetables, your meats. And to go back to what you were saying or your question about vegans, I don't think it's a good idea to completely eliminate animal products. Yes, if you're doing it from an ethical perspective. Mm. Okay. Yes, if you're doing it from an ethical sp- perspective. You can reduce your eat, uh, meat production, uh, meat consumption, mm. but in terms of completely ruling it out, you know, I've seen patients that come in with, you know, complete B12 deficiency, and it can cause things like peripheral neuropathy, which is sort of when your nerves don't work, and you start having sort of sensations and tingling in, or not being able to feel your legs, and that can happen from, from severe B12 from, deficiency. from being vegan. From being vegan, that's because crazy. Meat is one of the most basically, important guys, don't be vegan. That's that's the moral, <laughs> moral of this part. Um, so I think we've highlighted diet quite a lot And Islamically Also a, a comment on Ramadan is that You know Ramadan coming up in February this year Isn't it so 
We only got really because it's it's October now. Allah Akbar. Allah. Akbar. Flying. Like just a few days ago in July, man, what the hell happened? It's <laughs> suddenly in October. Literally in a few months, Ramadan, you know, six months, Ramadan is, is coming uh, upon us, inshallah. And I feel like every every year the the the, the Imam in, in Jumma and you know after after Maghrib they sometimes give a talk or a khutbah, they always express like Ramadan is a time where you have to appreciate what you have. Definitely. And it's not a time because I'll be honest, even in the South Asian culture, and this might be a bit funny, but it's like do you know the uncles when they just when you go to Taraweh mm-hmm. and you can just and some uncle burps and you can just smell like every every subhanallah the onion the biyadu the pakora the samosa you can smell everything you smell what you had yesterday the day before as well and it's like that type of excess and sometimes brothers can't even go go to go to Taraweh because they've eaten so much mm-hmm. that they're, they're completely full well that's not the sunnah way so actually and listen I'm guilty of it I don't know who I'm fooling I'm guilty of this as well because you know in Ramadan you're hungry you're tired and it's not something that you're used to but I think it's really important upon us as Muslims to kind of take a step back and see we need to actually fix up on our diet and fix up on because the Prophet Muhammad said yes. you're never going to improve if you don't first look within you know we're, we're only going to improve as a community yeah. we start improving as individuals you know he says that we have to first look within ourselves what are we struggling within ourselves yeah. brothers aren't going to the brothers nowadays are saying oh you know we need to fight we need to fight you, you, brother you've got a pot belly what are you going to what are you going to fight for you know is that you have to first fix your diet fix yeah. your health fix yourself and there's another thing that you know we're talking about diet but also the importance of physical health going to the gym being active what what does firstly medical what's the medical perspective on this and then what's the Islamic perspective on this? Definitely. I think what you said is very important because even in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in Allah la yughayyub anfusim, which is that Allah will not change the condition of a people, of a community, until they change that within themselves. Mm. So it's a responsibility that we all have to, you know, reflect within and improve ourselves. And inshallah, one person at a time, the whole community gets and What better. would your tips sorry to I'm gonna go back on myself That's and then we can go back. What would your tips be? You know, for diet, Islamically and both medically. You know, you're a doctor. Medically and Islamically, what would your advice be to people? I think this? when it comes to your diet, you know, don't make drastic changes. If you try and do everything at once, it becomes very difficult to stick to. Make smaller changes. Make substitutions. You know, instead of going for a, a Coke, obviously we boycotted Coke. Boycott Coke, guys. Boycott Coke. BDS. Um, you know, water. Yeah. That we made everything life from water. Um, but also, there's certain things that we can do to help curb our, if we have a problem with overeating, because overeating, like excessive eating, is comes from our nafs, which means that our ability to control our desires. So, one of the beloved acts by our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was fasting the Sunnah days, Monday and Thursday. So, fasting is also, you know, one of the forms of worship in our religion, alhamdulillah. But it's also good prep for Ramadan, you know. Mm. If you don't fast all year, Ramadan comes, the first few weeks, yeah, uh, the first few days, it's going to be tough, yeah. it's going to be cooked. Um, so, sort of building up your tolerance to fasting, but it also gives you a period to sort of reflect on yourself, um, being able to show that you are able to give up your desires for the sake of Allah, for the sake of your health, and sort of um, and it's practice. Not, and it's not only just Monday and Thursdays yeah. that you can fast, it's like you can fast pretty much every day. Because it's, I think the recommended is you don't fast Friday. Yeah, because that's Jum'ah day, mm-hmm. and that's the recommended day that you can, you know, after Jum'ah is and then X, Y, and Z. But in Ramadan, for example, it's like there's other days except from Ramadan where fasting is recommended. Yeah. So, so in the Islamic calendar, we have the days that we call the white days, Ayyam Bayt, which is 13th, I believe, 13th, 14th, and 15th of, um, Muharram, of the month. So I believe it's Muharram, isn't it? I think it's Muharram. And it's Ashura. Yeah. And then there's Ramadan. Yeah. And then there's also Monday and Thursdays every week. Exactly. So SubhanAllah, we have so many opportunities in the year to fast. And fasting is not just about giving up food and creating Ramadan breath. Fasting is about <laughs> Ramadan breath. Also, okay, quick question, yeah? Go for it. This is, might be, it might be a sound of it. What is, what is the point? Of, what is the, how does Ramadan breath come about? Okay. Because so that's actually, this is going to be, I'm going to clip this up and put it on TikTok. Okay. Medic explains the Ramadan breath. Okay. So if you think about it, during the day, you know, we're always eating. We wake up, we have breakfast. We're drinking water. We eat throughout the day, so our saliva is constantly, you know, being swallowed, and sort of it has a chance to turn over. But during the day, when you're not eating, you're not drinking, that saliva is sort of staying in your mouth, and there's not as much 
clean, which is why I always tell people, even if you're fasting, brush your teeth yeah, three times, I mean, scrape you your tongue. You have to, yeah. right? And and some, some people say you're not allowed to, but as long as you don't swallow it. As long as you don't swallow it, you're fine. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and the purpose of some used to do miswak when. Miswak, exactly. And even so, even if you use mouthwash, it's fine. Let me switch but, it you know, in Islam it says that the breath of someone who's fasting is sweeter than the sweetest of musks yeah. or perfumes. Well, beloved to Allah, so another exactly. level. Exactly. In the best of musks. But wait, so, because it's the saliva, because yeah. the saliva is not being cleaned, yeah. because you're not eating anything. Yeah. So, when you're, so saliva gets clean when you swallow it. When you swallow it, exactly. But the more you're eating, um, the more turnover you have. But what happens is the saliva starts to stay around in your mouth. And the smell is from bacteria. So ah. what happens is, because you're not drinking, you're not cleaning out your mouth as often. Obviously, you're making robot five times a day, I hope, inshallah. Um, but what's happened is you start to get bacterial growth. And that's what causes the smell. And that's and that's every day. Is the way that's right? every day. Allah, that is that's crazy, you know. Subhanallah. So that's okay. We've covered now the. So we talked a lot about God. That will be edited out. Actually, no. You know, what? I'm gonna leave that in. So that everything is real. Yeah. So we talked a lot about you know the dieting and and everything like that. But my question now is the importance of physical health. So physical health, Islamically, and also. Just generally, med- medicinally, mm. where does physical health come? Into first, let's talk about Islamically, and then the importance of it and value of it for a medical from a medical perspective. So, sort of going back to when we discussed basis of Islam, so your five principles, uh, your five pillars of Islam. So your salah. So you need to physically be able to stand up and pray five times a day. Fasting also has a physical requirement to it, um, and then Hajj, which is physically demanding. But also, if we look at you know the best of examples of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, if we look at some of the narrations and descriptions of him, you know his appearance. Yeah, his physical appearance. He was described as being a man who was not fat nor uh, nor slim, nor thin rather. Uh, he was described as having broad shoulders and a broad chest. His chest was in line with his stomach, meaning that he didn't have a protruding belly. And there, I believe there's a narration from Umar radiallahu anhu, where he saw a man that had a protruding belly. And he asked him, you know, what is this? And he said, this is a, the barakah, this is yeah. a blessing from Allah. And Allah said, it's a curse. And he said, it's a curse. So, yeah. subhanAllah. So, it's something that, where we think abundance, you know, Allah may have given you the risk, the money, and then you use that to buy a lot of food, and then you, you know, over-consume. <laughs> yeah. To the point where you start to harm your physical health. So, that in itself is you not being able to control your nafs. So, your desire, you know, your desire to eat, you don't stop when you're full, but you keep eating. And... Sort of going back to why physical health is so important is that if we're able to look after our physical health, we're able to perform our acts of worship, our acts of ibadah. You know, if you're ill for whatever reason, may Allah grant you shifa and health, you know, you may not be able to go to hajj mm. or you may not be able to fast. And alhamdulillah, we have a very accommodating religion where if you are ill during Ramadan, you're able to make up those make up days yeah. at a later point. And, you know, even in the Quran, it says, Hajj is minister ta'ala sabila, so for whoever is able to make a way for it. Mm. And there are, excu- there are um, reasons if you're not able to, so you know, being unable to afford it, illness, physical health. So, alhamdulillah, our religion is one that is able to accommodate for those who are not able to do it. But in terms of the importance of physical health, um, you know, there's a hadith by a prophet uh, narrated uh, that's been graded as authentic where it says that al Mu'min al Qawi. Which means that a strong believer is better than a weak believer. Uh, yeah, and is more loved to Allah. And there is goodness in both of them, but it's better to be a stronger believer. And that's both stronger in iman in your faith, but also physically, physically strong. Physically exactly. strong. Yeah. And do you think that so Islam is clearly expressing the importance of physical health? Hundred percent. How then does this? How does this then find its way? Because we talk about physical health, but what does physical health actually mean medicinally? What does physical health mean? Because nowadays brothers are saying physical health means like this and this and, yeah. and you know, but then these brothers can't run for more than 10 minutes. Sure. So then it's physical health. So what, what, you know what I mean? That my questioning is, what is physical health from a, from a medicinal perspective? Is it strong, like strength, like physical strength then, or bodybuilding strength and, and look? Or is it more how you're able to get on with your day i think definitely physical strength sort of actual strength is a component of physical health but it's not everything like you said there's certain brothers that will lift weights six seven days a week but can't do any cardio but cardiovascular health is what's going to keep you going right so 
physical health embodies a lot of things. So your strength, your cardiovascular, your endurance, stamina. So it's spread across a lot of domains because it's no good being able to lift 200 kilos if you're not able to, you know, run a mile. Mm. So everything, again, going back to stamina, it's about balance. So having the physical strength, but also having the agility, having the speed, having the stamina. Um, and it's about the balance of being able to do all of those things. Now, you know, as men, physical strength is important. We need to be able to, you know, support, uh, like, look after ourselves, but be look able to protect our family. Look after our families, you know, subhanAllah. Within a household, the man is the physical provider. He has to be able to, you know, protect the household, but also provide for the household. And a lot of that is 100%. going to be linked to physical health. Now, in terms of, uh, from an Islamic perspective, like I said, practicing Islam is not just for the, from the soul, but from the body. You know, whenever we stand up for salah and we say, Allahu Akbar, the body is contributing to that act of worship. So by looking after our physical health, we're also looking after our soul as well, by allowing it to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way he's supposed to be worshipped. Um, and in terms of, like I mentioned, the phys- more, physically act- more physically demanding acts of worship, like Umrah and Hajj, you need to, I mean, you've done Umrah, I've done Umrah, you know, walking around the Kaaba seven times in the heat, then you're doing Sa'i between Safa and Marwa. It's not, it's not easy and it requires physical um, exertion, exactly. And that's something that, you know, when you look after your health, it makes it a lot easier. You know, if you're, alhamdulillah, like yourself, a young, fit person who looks after himself, who plays football, who eats a balanced <laughs> diet, no chicken and chips. Um, yeah, well, what are we getting after this, bro? <laughs> <laughs> salad, salad, salad. Yeah, yeah. Um, then it makes it a lot easier. Mm. And in terms of within our religion, you know, like I said, as, as men, we're supposed to be a representation of our religion. So imagine if every Muslim was, you know, overweight doesn't look after himself then it's not a good rep- representation of our religion i think there was someone who said that for the represent representatives of islam you have to be you know what you want to see in in your in yourself right so when you look at yourself when you look at the ummah who do you want to be the leaders and who's going to take the ummah forward if you look at the sahaba umar abu bakr khalid bin munid even um, Ali, I keep saying, well, you have to, have to say it. Have to. These Sahaba were people who were men, warriors. warriors. Exactly. Then they say, uh, there was a video of Muhammad Hablas, Hul- he was saying, yeah. Rijal, there's no Rijal. Yeah. And he was screaming. But those were the Rijal, and those were the men of the society. And you can tell by just their physical appearance, even, even if they may have not had that, you know, the, the ideal body nowadays. What's the ideal body? They might have not had that, but what were they? They were strong men, they were characters, they were warriors at heart. And in, in the battlefield and at, you know, in, the, in their physical appearance. So, Islamically, it is important that we have, even if you look at the, you just describe the description of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and even if you look at the, the other Prophets, Yusuf Alayhi Wasallam, they said that 50, imagine, 50% of the world's beauty was put in just one man, Yusuf Alayhi Wasallam. And it's like, this, this shows the value of holding yourself, not just in your mannerisms also in your appearance and also in your physical body and also in your physical appearance to a standard which Islam is set to a standard that's why you know uh, even in the mosques you know, if you go to the mosque you make sure your clothes are clean you make sure you're, if you're wearing a thob you have a nice thob you make sure you're fully covered you cover your knees you cover your, your you make sure you're clean don't smell bad because you're trying to you're trying to present yourself for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but also we have to present ourselves in that manner because you, if you see a brother scruffy in the mosque and he's you're going to want to help him, you're going to want to think, why, why is this the case? Because it's not typical. And that's what we need to be displaying as Muslims in general. Is that if you see a brother scruffy and he's a bit like, his, mm-hmm. half his, his backpack's on his shoulder, and other, you don't want that to, you don't want that person to be like, like that. You want to aid him. You don't want for your brother what you want for yourself. So you have to aid him. And because they are going to be the representations of Islam. I, like, when we, even when we're making this podcast, you know, two Muslim men talking, for a non-Muslim, we're going to be, to an extent, a representative of Islam. When a woman's wearing a hijab, yeah. she is automatically a representative of Islam. If I'm speaking or wearing a thobe, I'm a representation of Islam. So it's very important that we, we understand that. And that's very important Islamically as well, I think. And I went on a bit of a yap there. No, no, hardly all like Everything said was valid. Also, okay, so now we're talking about physical health. What is then the effects of physical health on both mental and psychological health? They're both similar, but what do you think is the effect? And also, how does someone 
you know, we talked a lot about, oh, we have to be strong. How does someone actually get there? Because we're not on a gym page ultimately. We're not going to be like, suddenly, next, next video is us lifting lift. weights, <laughs> doing deadlift. Like, yes. But how does someone improve their physical health? By following the, 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 the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because I know a lot of brothers nowadays saying, oh, if I go to gym, then there's so much fitna around, like there's sisters walking around there and I don't feel comfortable. How do, firstly, brothers have become that, that sort of illness, in my opinion, that's an illness. But how does physical health then benefit, you know, both from Islamic and from a medis- medicinal perspective? I just want to touch on something you said, which is like really important, that we're representatives of Islam. Mm. And subhanAllah, the way we carry ourselves in itself is da'wah, because we're representing Islam. You know, if you saw... If you have no idea about Muslims and you start to see, you saw, you know, people who were not conducting themselves in the best of behavior, then that's the image you have of Islam. But when you see, you know, both brothers and sisters who are looking after themselves, conducting themselves in a way that's adherent to Islamic guidelines, where they're looking after their physical appearance, their, the way they conduct themselves, their akhlaq, their mannerisms, then it gives a better image of Islam. So it's so important that we conduct ourselves and look after ourselves and hold ourselves to a high standard in line with Islam. Because there's a better representation of our mm. religion. You know, Islam is perfect, we're not perfect. Exactly. So we have to strive to go to try and reach the level or the example that Islam has set up for us. Now going back to your other question, which was about sort of physical health and how someone can improve their physical health and sort of remind me what, what one of the questions. Versus by following the Sunnah, following improve Sunnah, their exactly, Islamic yeah. health, you know, their, their physical health. Yeah. But also um, the effects of physical health on mental and psychological health and the importance and advice that you would give someone you know, trying to improve I think the first thing you can do is have the right intention you know you've probably heard it a million and one times but in Islam it says in the mal bin that um, actions are by their intention hmm. so if you make your intention that look for example you know maybe your diet's not great maybe you're not exercising well if you make the intention that you know I'm doing this so that I can be a better Muslim then subhanAllah Allah will grant you as you intended you know and one of my favorite sayings is Man lillah, minha. that whoever leaves something for the sake of Allah Allah will replace it with something better so for example if you make the intention look I'm going to you know stop being lazy stop eating to junk food for the sake of Allah so that I can have better focus in my salah that I can get my fitness better so that I can go to Umrah and be invited by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to his house, then Allah will grant you something way better than what you mm. had. Mm. So for yourself and myself and for everyone watching, I ask Allah to make it easy for us to become better Muslims. I mean, I mean. So that's the first thing, having the right intention. Because sort of mindset is a huge thing when it comes to health. You know, I've had days where, you know, I, do, I can't be bothered to go to the gym. But I'm like, you know, Motivation isn't here today, but discipline is what's going to carry you when motivation can't. Mm. So having the right mindset with the right intention will make it leaps and bounds easier to fall into that routine. And to answer your question where you said um, about brothers who saying they don't want to go to gym because fitness. I mean, again, your intentions, if your intentions are to go to purely work on yourself and that you're not going to, you know, stare at other people and, you know, listen to music and do those types of things. Then I ask Allah to make it easier for you, inshallah. Yeah. But it's like, there are certain things you can do to make it easier for you. For example, go at times where the gym is less busy. Hmm. Um, you know, if you see someone using, or like a lot of, let's say for example, your brother, you're trying to avoid mixing with the sisters in the gym. If you see them using one area, work in a different area. Pick up your weights, move out elsewhere, lower your gaze. Try and do things that will make it easier for you to avoid this fitna. Um, like for example in my gym Alhamdulillah is one uh, where I live I go right off the bedroom because there's no one else in there and the music's not playing so I'm able to work out with no distraction Alhamdulillah um, but again there's certain things you can do and it all comes down to discipline for example if you know that gym's going to be empty after bedroom go in the morning right if you know that's going to be empty at night and then sort of we're going to come to the importance of sleep schedule but then you can arrange your sleep around it so there are certain mm. things you can do as an individual to make it easier on yourself and then your other question was importance before, before of, we go into that yeah, sure, sorry. let's talk about because physical health kind of links in with sleep like how does sleep contribute to someone's physical medicinally okay. contribute to someone's physical health so when I say sleep is probably one of the most underrated aspects of health like it doesn't get enough credit and I think it's something... We're cooked, guys. We're we are cooked. so cooked. I mean, like, as students, you know, as 
you know, we have hustles on site, we have part-time jobs, we have assignments, we have exams, podcasts. podcasts. When life gets tough, the first thing we sacrifice is our sleep. 100%. You know, assignment to you, I'm going to do an all-nighter. I'm going to stay up an extra hour, extra two hours, just to get the work done. So, subhanAllah, we never give sleep as much credit as it deserves. And it's so important because sleep is a time where our body is able to heal. You know, they say the three things you need for gym progress is sleep. train hard, eat clean, and sleep. Because it's during that sleep where your body's able to recover, your muscles are able to rebuild Whoa. bigger, you're able to progress in your strength. And, you know, you could be eating the right things, you could be training seven times a day, seven times a week rather, but if your sleep isn't there, you're cooked. You're cooked. And sort of, there's more, there's more to it. So for example, for us as men, and I know we've been talking about it from a male perspective, but everything we're speaking about is equally, if not more important from a female Female perspective as well. Like it's important for women to, you know, get their diet correct, to get their exercise correct. It's a doctor talking guy. It's not a misogynist. He's a a doctor talking guy. I'm equal right. (laughs) Yeah, doctor talking guy. But it's equally important. So we have been speaking from it from a male perspective, but everything applies to both male Mm. and female. Mm. Um, And sort of, Going back to us as men, so lack of sleep has been proven in so many studies. You know, if you have a scientific background, go on PubMed, um, go on NCBI and have a read about the countless studies that have been done between the link of lack of sleep and low testosterone. Mm. So, you know, if your sleep's not good, then you're going to have difficulties with low testosterone and that can affect muscle growth, it can affect mood, it can affect progress in the gym. It Reproduction can affect, as well, no? Reprodu- it can affect fertility. So, you know... Obviously, a lot of brothers are getting married now. Children are going to be in the future. So it's something that you really want to consider. I and think that happens later on. They don't get sleep when they're <laughs> not getting the sleep. Exactly. Anything. And then once you have kids, you're not getting sleep because yeah, they're crying exactly. all night. But also, like, Islamically, if we look at it from an Islamic perspective, you know, mm-hmm. our whole day and schedule has been put in place by us, for us by us. The five daily prayers that are put in, and I know it's easy to criticize it from the West because, like, for example, some days Fajr is at like in the summer, for example, Fajr is at like three a.m. and I was like, how am I going to start my day at three a.m. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and there's such a small gap between Esha and Fajr, and then like, oh, you know. But Islamically, especially now we're in the winter, this is literally the perfect timing. You preferably sleep. I think it's after Esha, an hour after Esha. I believe that the. Or you can correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. But I think the authentic position is that around around an hour after Esha, you pray with them before you, and after you pray with them, you go to sleep. That's uh, that's from what I've understood, and then you wake up from Fajr Salah. After Fajr Salah, you continue with your day. You don't go back to sleep, and this is what Prophet Muhammad said. After Dhuhr, I believe he used to take a nap. It was after Dhuhr. I believe so, but double, double check. I can't be. It was concerned. either after Dhuhr or after Asr, till the next Salah, you take a nap, and that's during your day. And then you pray Maghrib, you eat dinner, you pray Asha, then you go to sleep again. So if you look at the structure, say for example. Let's now let's let's put this into perspective of today's day. You Esha's at nine thirty. Let's say Esha's at nine thirty. Yeah. Maghrib's at seven. I know it's a bit earlier now, but let's say Maghrib's at seven. Esha's at nine thirty. You pray Esha at ten. And you go to sleep. You go to sleep at ten. You wake up. Fajr's at six thirty. Six. You wake up at six. You pray Fajr. Blah blah blah. And after you pray Fajr Salah now, you get on with your day. You then. Get to the whole time, 1 o'clock. You take a nap for a couple hours. You wake up at 3 o'clock, Asr time. You then do work again from Asr to Maghrib. Finish with your day. You pray Maghrib. You have dinner. You go again. If you just look at that schedule, do you see how, how better in place, how more structured that is than not what brothers are doing nowadays. You stay up till Fajr. You pray, you pray Fajr. You go to sleep. You wake up at the whole, you, late the whole, You pray Asr. There's no structure. Or you structure your day. Your day should be structured around your Salah. Around and sleep is put in place by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you sleep. Mm-hmm. But you structure your day around. And this is something that I've actually tried to be adopting now more, more than ever, is not sleeping after Fajr Salah. Because when I was in New York, I was in New York recently, obviously for the UN, they'll be on this channel. I had to wake up early, 6 30 a.m., pray Fajr, and then I got on with my day. And you're so much more productive. SubhanAllah is, and you were telling me as well recently that you, when you wake up for Fajr Salah and you stay up, your day is so much longer. Your day is so much more productive. Like in the summer, you'd wake up at 11. I'll roll out of bed at 11. I'll roll out of bed at 11. Get my day started at 12. The whole day is gone. 9 p.m. You go to sleep. You, know, you don't go to sleep, but 9 p.m. is Maghrib. Done. You had nine hours in the day. But now you wake up at 6. Maghrib is at 7. You had 13 hours in a day where you were able to do stuff. You know what I'm trying to say? So Islamically, our day has been, been scheduled around for us already. 
and I think that's something that, you know very beautiful Islamically yeah, it's, it's, it's sorted and going back to you obviously we talk now about sleep and do you have any other further points that you want to talk about you know, added about sleep definitely I think you hit the nail on the head there when you said sort of subhanAllah when you schedule your day around your prayers mm. you prize them obviously five daily prayers is a non-negotiable in our religion alhamdulillah it makes your life a lot easier and now subhanAllah now that we're in winter you know Asia is getting earlier mm. Fajr is getting um, later later so like right now like you said the two, if, uh, Asia now is like eight something Fajr is five something you can you, if you go to bed straight after Asia and you wake up a Fajr you're getting a good eight nine hours sleep I mean what's this whole eight hours thing about the way so is it legit? Is it a myth? I'm someone, due to work and uni and other um, obligations, I've had to do some days two hours sleep, three hours sleep. That's crazy. But alhamdulillah, the, the last, I'd say about six weeks, I've been consistently getting seven to eight hours and my life has changed. And is that seven to eight hours, is it, is it legit? Is it like it's seven legit. To eight? It is legit. It, it's legit. It improves you in your life. Everything, bro. My mood is better. I can train hard in the gym. You know, I'm focused more, I'm more productive. And that's something where I don't have to, I'm not missing my Fajr and I'm not missing my Asha. So Literally, after Asha, I'm in bed and I'm up maybe 30 minutes. Camera's there in it. Yeah, just sit <clears throat> I have to preface something, guys, uh, in this video. Now the quality of the video has gone up exponentially, subhanAllah. This video looks so much better now. But it's because my laptop, which I normally record on, and I record audio on, is unfortunately dead, it just died, I don't have my charger on me so we're going to film the rest of this video on the iPad uh, Eamon's iPad, alhamdulillah uh, but the audio won't be recorded on this so hopefully inshallah the audio is okay inshallah uh, but we, we're actually coming to the end you know, of, our, of our discussion when we're talking about you know, the health, the, 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 the sleep when we're talking about how it's changed your mood, it's changed everything and the Prophet Sallallahu always used to express the importance of sleeping like, he used to he used to take the nap after the horror and, and he expressed how that can and even if, even when you do it I, I was gonna ask as well yeah. what's the issue of oversleeping? Okay. So just to finish up on what I was saying before yeah. the laptop died. Sorry about the laptop the difficulties. Yes. Um I'm trying to remember. So yeah, so once I change my sleep schedule, so literally after Esha, I'm in bed. Now I think Esha is about eight thirty, so yeah. I'm in bed by like nine fifteen. Mm. I'm up at about 4.45 to Hajjud for a little bit and then Fajr and then read Quran after Fajr. Like, I can't stress how important it is to try and make time during your day for Quran. And I think Fajr is one of the best times, you know, in the Quran, says, uh, in the Quran Fajr, kind of mashhoda, that it will be witnessed by the angels, subhanAllah. So, and even, like you said, when you start your day after Fajr, you feel more productive. And even, I believe, the Prophet from the Sallallahu said, Barakli Ummati fi Bukuriha, to have, there is more barakah for my ummah in the early hours. So subhanAllah, we never appreciate it, but you know, when you start your day after Fajr, at the end of the day, you say, you know, today I've done X, Y, Z, and I've had such a productive day. And subhanAllah, it's not just because you've woken up earlier, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put more barakah in your day, more blessing in your day. Blessing exactly. in day. And in terms of the importance of sleep, like, like I said, Islam is a religion of moderation. We shouldn't have too little sleep, but we shouldn't also have too much sleep. Because then it starts to cut into our productivity. You know, in the Quran it says, layla libasa, ma'asha. That we've made the day a comfort to, for sleeping, and that the, uh, sorry, the night for sleeping, and the day for, you know, productivity. To I, and, and with that, I had, I had a sheikh recently, and he was talking about how the, the people who work night shift, mm. where physically your body is, is not used to being up at that, at that time. It's like, so even the people who work during the, the night shift and then sleep during the day. There's something not right. They, they, they explain it themselves that there's something not right with them. Like they feel a bit off. They feel that there's something wrong because naturally, you know, you want to sleep at that time. And that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 100% because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us this. So now going kind of away from that, is that, so yeah, so oversleeping, is that like, what, what is the deal with oversleeping? You know, is, is your body starting to catch up from the sleep weeks ago where you didn't get a proper amount of sleep or what is it? You know, uh, a very good friend of mine has been telling me for like the last few weeks that they have the sleep debt and it's like this is from exams and things so essentially there was a period where they weren't sleeping or they were cutting sleep they were prioritizing on their assignments and exams and what happened is essentially that starts to take a toll on your body and like all debts it needs to be repaid so what happens is your body will make you 
essentially sleep for longer periods to try and catch up to that sleep debt. And sort of depending on how long you've had that sleep debt, sometimes, you know, I've seen certain studies that say for every hour of sleep that you miss, it takes four, four days to catch up on or something like that. Yeah. Some people, it takes years for them to catch up on sleep. I mean, 18 years in education, we're cooked. Let's go. Um, but sort of in terms of oversleeping, it can come from multiple things. So if you have, you know, an irregular sleep schedule where you're sleeping at different times, then it's difficult for your body to regulate. For example, the way your body regulates your sleep is your circadian rhythm. Mm. And you might have heard of a supplement called melatonin, which is yeah. what some people take to help them to fall asleep. But essentially your body naturally produces it. Um, and what you do when you take a lot of, or take it externally is you try and regulate it. But our circadian rhythm is, like I said, linked to the cortisol where it's at its height when you wake up. It's very difficult when you work a night shift because you just turn that off on its head. And as humans, we're built to sleep during the night and sort of live during the day. And I've done night shifts in hospital. It's very difficult because every one of your natural instincts is telling you it's time to sleep. But your brain is saying, no, it's time to work. And it takes about a couple of days to get back into the normal cycle of things. You know, you're eating breakfast when everyone's eating dinner. You're going to bed when everyone's heading out to work. So it's very difficult and it's not within our human nature to do that. But obviously due to the circumstances of our jobs and our lives, we may have to. And that's why also the people who like, you know, work night, they can't sleep as long. They can't sleep for the seven, eight hours they need. They, they get in, maybe let's say they, for example, they finish at eight, they get home by 10. They sleep until maybe two, three. They can't sleep till seven, nine. They have to only, they can sleep for maybe six hours. And that's because their body's so physically exhausted that it has to have that amount of sleep. But it can't get like the nice amount of sleep that you actually need, right? And sleep is not just a quantity thing, but a quality thing, you know. How good is your sleep? I've slept 10 hours before and- On a plane, in a bed. <laughs> And I'm, I've woken up tired. But there's been times I've slept three hours and I've woken up refreshed. Refreshed, yeah. Exactly, so quality is a huge aspect of sleep. Mm. So then, now we've talked a lot about that and we've talked about sleep. And I think it's now very important we highlight the last thing that we want to discuss in this episode is the relation between, because we've mentioned it a million times now, Mental health and physical health. Obviously, I did the episode with Jamana and Amal. Make sure to check it out, guys. It'll be linked in the description. It's a very good episode. <laughs> um, and we talked about mental health and beyond stigma and, and that type of thing. But in a form of strictly medical perspective, and we can go into Islamic perspective a bit as well, is there a clear relation between mental and physical health in Islam? 100%. And I'd like to say first that if anyone is currently experiencing any issues with their mental health, then please seek help from a qualified professional. And I ask Allah to make it easier for you, inshallah, and grant you health and wellness in all aspects of your life. I want to put a link in for... I think it's Good Samaritan? Good Samaritan, I'm yeah. sure. So I'll put a link in the show mm. description. And their number as well. Um, inshallah. Um, I think mental and physical health are absolutely linked. You know, there's days where, you know, physically, you, you know, exhausted, and it starts to take a toll on you mentally. And the other way around as well, you know, whether you're experiencing you know anxiety depression overthinking it can take a toll on your uh, physical health as well and again i'm not a qualified mental health practitioner so please you know if you are experiencing anything or want to learn more then do your own research in that regard drink water guys um but in terms of that like for example uh, you may have heard the term runner's high but it's something that runners experience where through their physical activity, they're able to, it, it causes a release of dopamine mm. and that makes, that gives them that feel good sensation. So there is a clear and heavily studied link between our physical health and our mental health. And is that because of dopamine? It's because of dopamine. So dopamine is one of the neurotransmitters or chemicals that are produced in our brain. That's where you, you get it if you listen to music, if you're doing something that makes you, you know, excited. Exactly. That's where dopamine comes exactly. from. Right? And you know, they also say that you are what you eat. So, you know, if you're eating good, clean, healthy foods, you're going to feel healthy. If you're eating, you know, Fat, crap, yeah. junk food, we're going to feel yeah, crap. Exactly. And I think there's such a huge emphasis on, I'm going to go back to the sort of the male example as well. So, you know, when we physically work out, we, produce, we increase our testosterone mm. and increase testosterone production or rather the opposite, low testosterone, one of the main symptoms is low mood, anxiety, depression, overthinking. And sort of one of the routes that can be used to tackle it is 
trying to understand what the root cause is. So for example, you know, if you've got poor diet, poor exercise, looking at those as points of, you know, if I try and fix this, maybe it will help with my mental health. And, you know, it is difficult to do and it's difficult to understand because everyone is different in what they're experiencing mentally. And it's very difficult to, you know, try and see someone's perspective from that regard, especially if it's something we, we've never experienced. Um, but it's extremely important in terms of when looking after your mental health to take in, um, when looking after your physical health to take in your mental health as well. Because, you know, a lot of people have said, you know, they've been experiencing depression, anxiety, and the gym was one of the things that helped them to come out of it. So that's, what, that's how there, there's a clear link between physical and mental health. Because in the video with, we were talking with Jamana and, and Amal, they were talking to me about how going through their difficult, if they were in a difficult time, going out, you know, exercising, playing a sport. And also I think sports as well is, is, is not only beneficial because it's um, physically, like physical activity, but also social activity. If you're playing football, for example, you're playing with a bunch of guys, you're playing with a bunch of friends, or you're playing with, that's social activity, and that's also beneficial for mental health. And that's, that's not even something that you can, you, you don't even need to prove medicinally, it's just known, right? Mm -hmm. Social activity will benefit your mental health. So similarly, physical activity will benefit your mental health as well, inshallah. But I think we've, I feel like we've reached a point where we've discussed so much. We've discussed a lot, and I feel like it might be an overload of what, and, and a lot of what we discussed. Do you have any kind of final messages you want to say, you know, for the audience, for the people watching? This camera, by the way, makes the video look so much better. Like, what yeah. the hell? Like, the, the issue is with the laptop is that the camera is not great, but it can connect to the mic quite well. Yeah. The issue with the iPad is the camera is great, but I don't think the audio will be that great because we can't we'll see, it. Inshallah. Yeah. Inshallah, it'll be good, though. Yeah. I think, sort of, in terms of final messages, is our health is so important. Our health is so important in terms of, you know, without it, we can't do much. Mm. You know, I know so many, I've seen so many patients, you know, mashallah, very successful in business or whatever field they were in, but they don't have their health, mm. right? If you ask a millionaire that's on his deathbed, what was, what's the one thing, if you could buy it, you would, their health? I went Jeff Bezos now starts going to gym. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Suddenly, suddenly he got rich this. and just got wham. Yeah. And I think health as an umbrella term, so many things come under it. Like mm. we were just saying about the mental health, like for example, me, one of the key ways I do stress after exams or, you know, if I've got something that's making me anxious or I'm overthinking about something, well, like once I started taking like my health seriously, like when I took my, ser my sleep seriously, gym. Um, gym, diet, everything, well, like, when I tell you my life got insanely better, I cannot sort of overstate it. So take health seriously. If you have any questions, go see a doctor, go see, alhamdulillah, you know, NHS is still free for now. <laughs> Um, seek help, seek advice, you know, from a legal perspective, if you don't like the advice that your doctor is giving you, you're legally entitled to get a second opinion as well, so do with that proper what you wish. Me, proper medic. Alhamdulillah. Um, and I ask Allah to grant us all health and wellness. Inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. He's so much wisdom, man. So much. He's an old man, but mashallah, he's <laughs> not that old. <laughs> he's not that old. But subhanallah, Jazakum Allah for coming on again. Welcome. Thank you guys for watching. I feel like this is a very different type of episode, but I like the type of you know, route that we're taking with these different these different types of episodes. You know, we talked about subcontinent in one episode, and then we're talking about mental health in another episode. We're talking about health, you know, physical health um, and medicinal health in another episode. And all of these are kind of within our community. And I told you the whole point point of this podcast is to talk about the issues that people don't often talk about. No one really making videos about Islam and health or Islam and mental health. So I feel like it's a duty upon me, no matter how many viewers I have, no matter how many people are watching, it's a duty upon me to try and you know make a change in the future. And even on Yom Qiyamah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at least acknowledge. He does Allah something. allowed us to intercede for us to do it. I mean, inshallah. And even if we can help one person, that's it. That's honestly, I've said that since the beginning of when I made YouTube videos on my channel. I said, as long as one person learns from my videos, that's done. And I've achieved it. So that's all time for watching everyone and I shall see you in the next episode of Decolonizing Narrative. Make sure to follow me down below. Um, my links will be in the bio. Follow us on Spotify, TikTok Forgotten History 8, Instagram Sultan Mahdi and YouTube Forgotten History. And I shall see you guys next time inshallah. Check out Amen as well. And I shall see you guys next time. Assalamu alaikum wa